Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure here to, to present in the seminar on, on behalf of the laureates. And uh, given all the, the previous talks that, that you've heard now, I'm going to take you uh, way up to the global carbon cycle and the role of, of uh, global forests in the global carbon cycle. I'm Gertjen Abius, I'm Professor of European Forest Resources at Wageningen University. And apart from that, I've also been in, involved in many IPCC reports some of them you see on the slide, and currently we're just finalizing the sixth assessment report, which will come out early next year. Also on the role of forests and mitigation. Well, before we look forward, I'm going to take you a little step back into a bit of, of history. And uh, here you see a, a paper that uh, we published uh, in 1992 uh, with my senior uh, Fritz Moore. And it was on, on the role of forests in mitigating climate change and a modeling analysis of forest types around the world. And it was already in, the, in that time that one of the Dutch coal-fired power plants, they wanted to compensate their emissions by planting forests around the world. And that has, we, we analyzed that, what they could do, and that has been put into practice. But what I thought then, I, well, I was very junior and I thought, well, carbon and forest, that's, that's going to go away. There will be different subjects in, in the future. But I was, I was very wrong about that. And still, I, I stayed in this field uh, very much, but I was very wrong thinking that. So I'm going to take you very quickly through the role of global forest in the carbon budget. Something about uncertainty and monitoring, which is part of, of the land use and, and assessing what the land use is doing. And then a little bit on to what degree can we actually change that balance? And can we, with forests and forest management, can we change the balance of, of carbon to mitigate climate change? And then some, uh, some very quick conclusions. And this graph you will have seen um, many times, I guess. This is the, the buildup of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, as measured by, uh, by David Keeling, starting in '58. Uh, now reaching something like 410 parts per million in the atmosphere. And it's not the, the curve so much which, is, which I want to point at, but it's, there were a couple of surprises for them what came out of it. Uh, one of the surprises was the seasonal fluctuations which you see in, in the graph. So apparently the northern hemisphere and the northern forest thus really had an impact on, on the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the second was is that uh, they knew the emissions from fossil fuels pretty much, they knew by this curve how much was building up in the atmosphere, they knew reasonably well how much was building up in the oceans, but in that balance there was a, a huge gap, there was a big uh, missing sink as it, it, it got that name. And this is when this, this first notion came up that forest and land use play an enormous role in the carbon cycle and this missing sink has really driven a lot of research uh, after that. Um, so this is now a, a more recent graph of the, or a, a budget, a CO2 budget. On the left you see the emissions from fossil fuels to r roughly 34 gigatons of carbon dioxide, but also land use change, mostly deforestation in the tropics, emitting carbon, additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that carbon has to go somewhere, the carbon atoms don't go away. So what we think now, what we see is that, uh, well, almost half of that builds up in the atmosphere. A quarter is, is taken up by the oceans, and then there is this 30% that is taken up by land, and mostly forests, what, what we believe. And this CO2 uptake, what is going to the land, has, has led to really a, a huge debate or where is it going? Is it going in the north? Is it going into the primary tropical forest? Is it the land management that is actually doing this? And, and to what degree has actually this, this uptake also been stimulated by the CO2 fertilization in the atmosphere? That has really ha led to a lot of debate. And here you see a graph where uh, on the plus, this is the emissions from fossil fuels and land use change, and in the minuses is where the carbon is going. And the green part is that is the carbon dioxide that is sequestered on the land. And what, you, what is characteristic here is that there's big annual fluctuations on how much carbon is actually taken up on the land, determined by the, the weather circumstances in those years.
Now a little bit, a step towards uh, uncertainty and monitoring. Can we actually say where this carbon is going? And now uh, I'm using this, uh, well, you may remember a, a paper by uh, Tom Crowther a couple of years ago, three trillion trees on the world. So I tend to say there are three trillion trees and we're still counting. And the picture you see a colleague of mine uh, in the National Forest Inventory in the Netherlands. And well, one of the, the uh, main uh, assessment methodology has been National Forest Inventories converting those stem wood volumes into carbon. And when you do repeated inventories, you can assess a carbon balance. We're still with its uncertainties, even though national inventories are, are very precise, but then all the additional steps lead to uncertainties. And these assessment methods have really developed very much over time. There's a variety of methods. Uh, in the top left, you see the national forest inventories that I just mentioned in the, in the bottom, you see Ediflux towers. There are a, a very limited number of locations in the world where a flux tower is directly measuring the CO2 uptake above, uh, above a canopy. On the top right is more one of the laureates, his, his field, Nick Scoops, uh, the, the role of, of remote sensing and, and new, uh, certainly a lot of developments, new developments there based on remote sensing, assessing also the dynamics in, in the forest with advantages and disadvantages on all these methodologies. And on the bottom right, you see where a lot of these, uh, the knowledge, uh, also, for example, the 3PG uh, model uh, is, is there from the laureates. A lot of these modeling analysis on the role of forest and forest management have also developed very fast over time. But all these methods have their pros and cons. For example, remote sensing is, is very good in assessing a cover loss of the canopy, but the cover gain is much more difficult. And all these methodologies just give a very large uh, variety of how the, the global forest sector is functioning at the moment. And this graph shows there in the, in the plus, it's a, a net emission, so the blue line there on the top left is from the integrated assessment models who are very much based on these modeling approaches but also on the cover losses from remote sensing they assess the role of global forest even functioning as a net source even when you take into account all the regrowth and management aspects but for example on the gray line fluctuating around the zero uh, this is how the national greenhouse gas inventories assess the role of global forests. And you see an enormous gap there of five gigaton of carbon dioxide uncertainty because of different methodologies, partly understood why these methods give differences, but partly also not understood why these differences are there. And this uncertainty really hampers if we want to get uh, uh, activities going in order to strengthen the role of, of uh, forests in mitigation the uncertainty really hampers to get activities going because you, you will not be rewarded if you have a huge uncertainty in, in the current uh, understanding of forests. Given this uncertainty, so to what degree can we actually change uh, the, the, the balance? And I'm just going to use a, a few global studies. There have been many studies uh, about this. Um, Let's say on the role of forests, the Paris Agreement does mention the role of forests, but in a very vague way. It's certainly not, not determined to what degree forests can be used to, to meet the commitments. But here you see uh, four future scenarios of how emissions need to be turned into a net zero balance around 2050 or 2060. And the gray is the fossil fuel emissions, which really need to be uh, taken down and the left graph is where you manage to do that very rapidly and then you don't need a lot of things on the land but on the right you see what is called a, an overshoot scenario where we do not manage to really uh, reduce the fossil fuel emissions and that means if you cannot reduce your fossil fuel emissions you need to take more and more measures on the land and that's those the, the yellow uh, negative numbers that you see on the graphs there. So less you can achieve with fossil fuels, the more we will rely on the land. And that is a big 
challenge. And here's another uh, a paper where I was also co-author with Stephanie Rowe on, the, Rowe on the contribution of this land sector in achieving those targets. And in all the global studies, it comes out that the role of land is, is very important in achieving these targets. And that's the, the green uh, wedge that you see there and on the role of uh, additional mitigation in the land use sector. Characteristic for these measures is always that it's, it's a huge variety of measures that you can take, uh, very much dependent on the local circumstances, very much also dependent on other needs of forest, other needs of, for fuel uh, and, and food production, and certainly also other needs on, on protecting biodiversity. And it's that whole set of functions that the land sector fulfills. It's within that set that the mitigation needs to be uh, established. Okay, now we're going uh, one step from the global, we go to a European, a bit more concrete uh, uh, measure, and this is uh, a, a European tree species map that we, in our uh, Wageningen group, we have a, a lot of uh, European scale resource analysis with the EFISEN model, and this is from the EFISEN model. Characteristic for Europe is, of course, that we have a lot of managed, young and regrowing forests. Um, this has been the, the notion since the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, very much, and the build-up of, of carbon all the time. But this notion is also changing, and this is a paper which we did with Mark Hanewinkel on climate change impacts and what the economic impacts may, may be on, on the European forest sector. And in red, you see where spruce can grow now uh, in its climate envelope, as we call it. And I will scroll through the timer. And the year now says current, and then it says 2010, 2040, 2040, 2070, and 2070, 2100. And you see that under a, a rather strong climate scenario, there's absolutely no chance for spruce in Central Europe to survive, where spruce is now very important, and even southern Scandinavia, it cannot survive. And these are dramatic changes, and we thought with our modeling, well, this is 2050, still far away, and it's a model with all its uncertainties, but however, the actuality is that spruce is already dying in Central Europe. And this is a picture from the Hartz, where all the brown is, of course, dead spruce. And uh, because of the drought in just two or three years, 2018 till 2020, bark beetle has developed massively and leads to massive uh, mortality. More than 200 million cubic meters already dead and, and rapidly expanding still. So climate change is not something from 2070, but it's, it's right here already now. And it, this poses large challenges for the sector to, uh, to adapt to these circumstances. It's not always as dramatic as in the picture, but it's also the more subtle environmental changes that also change the forest resources. And uh, this is a graph where you can see on the right, for example, in the, the gray shaded area, uh, this is how it was expected that oaks, oak stands will develop growing stock over time according to yield tables, but the dots are the more recent measurements, and you can see that the dots are way over the outside the yield tables. The environmental circumstances have changed so much that trees are growing much, much faster than, than what was al always measured in the past. These are the subtle changes which may also become more drastic in the in the future. A little bit on the role of forests, well, uh, very quickly, European forest, as I said, is a regrowing uh, resource. We analyze this and uh, what uh, in, we call this, uh, if you take a climate smart forestry approach, the current role of European forest of, of compensating 10% of the fossil fuel uh, emissions, you could almost double that contribution, close to 20%, if you invest in your forest management, in your resources, use wood sustainably. Uh, a little bit of uh, forest reserves are there as well, but this, this variety of forest management options, that is what we analyze for Europe. And in that variety, is very that's characteristic for climate smart forestry. You really look at the local circumstances, what is best to do. And just one, uh, one example 
that I want to show again how fast things are changing at the moment. This is a picture from Czech Republic where a clear cut was done because of the spruce uh, decline. And in the front you see that people have, uh, have planted beech. This is a, uh, a climate smart forestry run that we made with the EFISAM model. And in the dashed line is how the country is reporting to the UN now its, uh, its sink. Uh, so the negative is a sink of uh, roughly 10 million tons of CO2 in the, uh, in the 1990s. And in the climate smart forestry scenario, in our projection, you can see that it, it becomes very difficult to maintain that sink because of the, sp the bark beetle problems and, and the loss of forest and your, your necessity to, to change the forest resource. You can see that in our one of the lines we are even above the zero, so we, we project a small source for some time. It's, it's very difficult under these circumstances to maintain a sink. That is what we modeled then, but a few weeks ago I updated the graph and this is what the actual measurements now look like. If you look at the dashed line, this is how Czech Republic has uh, uh, projected uh, or, or has has reported to the UN its current forest sink. And the sink, as you can see, it has changed massively into a source. And this is the first time that a European country, maybe since the last 50 or 60 years, is massively acting as a source of carbon dioxide. Now, a little bit more, and I'm almost, almost there. Uh, we came from global forests, went to European forests, and now down to uh, even something like a small forestry country like the Netherlands. And this is one of our PhDs in a walnut uh, trial uh, in the Netherlands. So we're actually applying this climate smart forestry in, uh, in various ways. And this is what we are doing in our group. We have a group of luckily some 15 uh, very young and enthusiastic people. Uh, we implement, uh, one of the things is to implement this climate smart forestry idea in Dutch pilots and basically it comes down to more forest, better forest and a little bit more with wood. And that's the large integrated program that we are running. We are for example re revitalizing uh, poor Scots pine stands on poor sandy soils that you see on the top left. Uh, working more with mixed species, uh, selected provenances, adapted species, that's what we're doing. On the right bottom you see a picture of a linden uh, regeneration area. Those are the ones we are implementing together with the sector. We also analyze how the current forest is, is acting. And since the 1980s we have 60 small reserves in the Netherlands. And so we analyzed, on the left you see uh, a reserve established in the 80s. It was an existing Douglas fir stand, but then it was made into a strict reserve and it's, uh, it became a, uh, a hugely growing uh, resource with more than a thousand cubic meters per hectare in the Netherlands, which is, uh, which is very, uh, uh, well, ve uh, for us, also very new. And you see then on the lines, the, the yellow and blue, if you would continue your regular management. The thin gray line is if you use your wood and substitute other uh, like steel and aluminium, there's a substitution effect. So the gray line is developing over time as well. But the reserve so far has grown really very fast. So in terms of carbon, the reserve keeps on building uh, uh, carbon stock, at least for the time being, these 40, 45 years. It was also analyzed on biodiversity, but on biodiversity, the reserve differed almost nothing or well maybe some groups of ants it uh, it differed a little bit compared to regular management on biodiversity the reserves actually didn't uh, show any significant difference with a regular management and this is what you can later look at these are all the pilots we are executing and there is a, an online toolbox on uh, on climate smart forestry. There's also a European network developing on, on climate smart forestry with, with many groups uh, across Europe. And this is what we are pulling uh, as well. Now, given uh, the time, um, well, uh, what I want to say that given since this 1992 paper, uh, the global forest sector has changed enormously. 
uh, has certainly made big contributions, but things are really developing and changing very rapidly, as I showed with, for example, with the spruce uh, problems. Um, a lot of talking about the role of forests and mitigation, but in, pr in practice, because of the policies, not much has happened really in the land use sector. And that is characteristic for the land use sector. It's very difficult to get things going, with, given the, the millions of owners, landowners that you're dealing with, the various functions that you're dealing with, the food need, the, the wood needs, it's very difficult to get uh, things going. That is something to work on as well. And then uh, I close with my, my last slide to show you that there is forest in the Netherlands. And this is a picture of the forest behind my house, where we are going around with our mountain bikes. We dare to call them mountain bikes, even in the Netherlands. So thank you very much.